Why did so many people buy into the narratives of fear over the last two years of the COVID-19 chapter? Why is it that seemingly educated people, despite vast amounts of data, succumb to this fear-based messaging? How is it that despite people's own lived experience in the context of what was being put forth by media and governments, were people still complying with the narratives and failing to ask questions? These are questions that many of us have asked, but we have been fortunate enough in the recent months to have once again Matthias Desmet on the Elevate podcast, where previously in 2020, our first interview where we explored the concept of mass formation, which explains how uh, this herd mentality in the face of fear begins to take its grip. And that interview reached well over a million people, and it gave us a uh, a context to understand why human beings are behaving in such a way over the course of the last couple of years. Now, there are many more questions that each of us would like to ask. And to some extent, through Matthias's latest book, The Psychology of Totalitarianism, he's provided a indispensable guide to our times that we've uh, endured over the last couple of years. But we recently had the pleasure of inviting Matthias to the Elevate Network, our private social community, whereby he gave us nearly an hour and a half of his time uh, to take the questions from our audience and explore these themes in more depth. It was a truly fascinating conversation. We had a number of uh, fascinating questions and some open dialogue around some of these critical issues. And now you have the opportunity to take a, a peek in behind the scenes at the conversation that we had. If you would like to take part in conversations like this and be in the room and ask your questions with future guests, then please do come and join our supporter program within the Elevate Network at weareelevate.org. Uh, the Elevate Network is a private online social community where we have discussion forums, regular events, and we connect like-minded people as we explore the most pressing issues of our time and start to seek solutions to those challenges. And you'd be very welcome to join us there. Join us at weareelevate.org. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy this fascinating conversation with Matthias Desmet. So firstly, formally welcome to this special Q&A session inside the Elevate Network. If you're here for the first time, uh, we hold monthly Q&A sessions with our podcast guests and our guest experts from within our network to explore the issues of our time. Uh, the Elevate Network, if you're brand new, is a, is a private community for change makers, free thinkers, where we come together to try and make sense of the world and explore solutions to the problems that we're facing, both in terms of a uh, where we're necessary policy campaigning, but more importantly, forward facing um, systemic change. And Matthias, as I mentioned, has been a key figure in helping us to understand some of the uh, not only the psychology of what's happening here, the group mentality through mass mass uh, formation, but also a, a deeper ideology and a deeper worldview. And uh, we're going to explore tonight over three key sections over the course of an hour. We're going to look at uh, some of the root causes of mass formation and totalitarianism. We're going to look at some of the consequences and how it's shown up over the last couple of years. And we're going to look at solutions and how we can break through these patterns. We've had a number of questions that have been pre-sent to us, pre-submitted before tonight's event. There's two ways that you can answer, ask your question tonight. Either in the chat, and Felicity will collate the questions and we'll put them in our, uh, our running order list in, in, in a separate document. Or you can click the reaction button and raise your hand so we can see your hand raised on the screen. Uh, there's too many screens for us to see you raise your physically, physical hand, so we have to go over digital and have you raise the, physical, uh, the digital hand. And because of the time we have, everyone will have one question. And uh, if you can be very succinct and specific in your question, uh, that would really help us to give Matthias the most time possible to answer questions. Um, Matthias, to kick us off, uh, we were discussing before the session in terms of the root causes of the, or the pre precursors to mass formation. Uh, we were talking about the, or, and you speak about this in your book extensively, the mechanistic worldview. It'd be really useful to, to explain the problem of the, of, of the mechanistic worldview to kick us off, and then we'll get into some of the deeper questions from our audience. Okay, that's, that's, okay. that's good. Um, well, first, the, the, the mechanist's view on man and the world more or less boils down to this. 
the, the, the entire universe is a kind of a machine, uh, a dead machine composed of elementary particles that all interact with each other. So molecules, atoms that all interact with each other according to the laws of mechanics. And that's very important. That can be entirely understood in a rational way. So uh, that was the idea that emerged and that slowly became dominant from the 16th century onward um, uh, in, our, in our culture. And um, well, uh, that in itself, this idea that uh, the mystery of life can be grasped in rationalist terms and can be reduced to, to, to logical understanding had very specific and important psychological consequences, I think. On the one hand, so the, it, of course, this, 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 this idea, this, this, the, 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 the attractiveness of this mechanist view on man and the world was that man would ever be able to completely understand, control, and manipulate the world and to recreate natural phenomena in such a way that uh, um, 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 man um, uh, would be able, in the end, uh, to um, exclude all suffering, to even eliminate that and to live eternally. That was something that was very ex ex explicitly articulated from the 18th century onwards. So this mechanist view on the man in the world um, uh, claimed that there was no such thing as God. But in a very short time, the, the, the man sneaked to the throne of God and put himself at the throne. And he believed that uh, he could create, uh, he, he could make human beings live eternally, uh, 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 end all suffering, uh, make them, keep them in a constant state of happiness through manipulating uh, their, biochemical, their biochemical processes. You, you find this kind of ideology uh, in books such as uh, Homo Deus of uh, Yuval Harari. Uh, uh, in our times, but there are also such ideas already in, uh, in the 19th century, for instance, and even in the 18th century. So this is like this, 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 this idea of, 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 of that, that, that this mechanist human man in the world believes that the, the entire universe, uh, man included, is a kind of a mechanistic device, uh, a machine-like entity, uh, which can be uh, rationally understood, controlled, manipulated, and so on. And this way of thinking had specific consequences, both at the level of the population and at the level of the elite. At the level of the population, you could say that uh, it made more and more people feel disconnected from their environment. So it isolated people from their environment. First, mechanistic thinking in itself isolates people from their environment. As soon as you uh, start to believe that you can reduce everything to to, to the categories of your own logical thinking, you do not resonate anymore with the mystery of life outside of you simply because you reduce that mystery. You eliminate it by reducing it to, ever, to, 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 to your own rational understanding. So I explain that in much more detail in my book. And then in, as, in a second step, this kind of thinking also led to industrialization, mechanization of the world, and the, and the excessive use of technology, which also leads to this disconnecting effect. It disconnects people also from their environment. So it is this kind of thinking that lets that disconnected people from their environment and once disconnected, they become vulnerable for mass formation. I've explained that in many podcasts and it's mass formation in its term that leads to totalitarianism. So there is a straightforward um, causal chain between mechanist, the mechanist fuel man in the world and the concentration camps actually, or uh, the phenomenon of totalitarianism. And also then, that's at the level of the population, at the level of the elite, um, this kind of, this mechanist thinking replaced the religious elite and the noblemen by a new elite, uh, um, um, uh, which uh, tried to understand mass, the masses and the population and which tried to manipulate and control them through indoctrination, propaganda, psychological warfare, and so on. So that is something that I will explain in a second book now, but it will take me some, take me some time. So we've seen this kind of mechanist thinking leads to a new psychological state in the population, and it also recreated a new elite, which didn't use overt power anymore, but which used 
uh, manipulation uh, uh, um, uh, in the first place of the population. So uh, that's a little bit uh, the way in which you can consider mechanist thinking the root cause of both the new elite and the new population, which together leads to the phenomenon of, uh, of totalitarianism. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to um, Russell for the first question from our audience. Russell, I'm just going to bring you up onto the screen. Good to see you again. Okay, hello. Hello. Uh, great to see you again, uh, Matthias. Um, I, I posted a question via the um, uh, uh, via the network uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm interested to know your view on the extent to which Sweden is, and for many decades actually, um, has been the test bed for this so-called pro progressiveness in which into which we're being driven. Um, I think over the years, Sweden's embodiment of technocratic, egalitarian environmental and politically correct value seems universally to be admired. But in reality, Sweden's conformist culture and its generous social benefits suggest a sinister undercurrent of acquiescence to authority and uh, an over-reliance on the welfare state. Um, it, it seems to me that Swedish politicians have been carrying out, in reality, a mass but silent experiment in social engineering that teeters on the edge of totalitarianism. And when I hear of um, the Swedes unquestioning enthusiasm for things like implantable digital IDs, I wonder if this is where we're headed, but actually heading over the edge uh, on which Sweden seems precariously balanced uh, as we speak. Can we learn lessons from Sweden? You know... I'm not really familiar with the specificity of the case of Sweden, but I, I, I also noticed that uh, they are very prone and are very willing to, to accept uh, such, such things as implantable chips and so on. Uh, that's possible. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Swedish population um, proved quite resilient to the mass formations of the, of the, of the, of the Second World War, of, the, of, the, of Nazism, uh, but indeed, they seem very yeah, vulnerable and prone to uh, this more technocratic ideology, I think, that uh, seizes uh, control of society now. And that's something typical, of course. What we see now uh, is a new kind of totalitarianism, which is based on the ultimate totalitarian ideology, which is always the mechanist ideology. The mechanist ideology is the ultimate totalitarian ideology, and the ultimate totalitarianism is not a communist totalitarianism, nor... A fascist totalitarianism, the ultimate totalitarianism, is always the technocratic totalitarianism. A technocratic totalitarianism, which is led not by people such as Hitler or Stalin, but by dull bureaucrats and technocrats. That was what Hannah Arendt, Hannah Arendt warned us already for in 1951. And that's, I believe, uh, what we, we uh, can see with our own eyes emerging now in our society, uh, technocratic totalitarianism. And it's possible, it's possible what you say that uh, Swedish Swedish people in the end um, will be forerunners in that, and that they will be they will be very very vulnerable for that. It's perfectly possible, uh, 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 but I couldn't give you much more information than what I give you now. Now I'm afraid. Um, okay, that's great. Thank you very much. I, for me, that was where the birth of uh, environmentalism came from, and uh, really began this whole journey that we seem to be on at the moment. But thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Russell. Uh, I'm going to come to Diana next, if I can find you in my uh, list of your question. Let me see. There's quite a few of us here tonight. Um, bear with me a moment. Participants, add to spotlight. You know, your video is not currently on, Diana, but I'm going to try and add you to the, uh, the screen here. Um, bear with me a moment. Yeah. You're here? Yeah. Good, I'm good. I'm eating supper, so I just... <laughs> uh, no worries. Yeah. Do you, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? I'll see if I can bring you up. Well, it was just, you know, Matthias, I can't remember the exact percentages, but something like 70% of the population, according to you, your theory, um, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, um, you know, total, totally believing the mass formation psychology. So, you know, what hope does that give for, you know, for it to ever... For, for us to win, to, for it to succeed, our, our, you know, sorry, I'm not being very articulate, but for our, um, for us to stop this awful thing that we're moving towards. 
No, the, the figures I mentioned were different. I, I mentioned that somewhere in between 20 and 30 percent is really into the process of mass formation and yeah. is really hypnotized. And yeah. then an addition, an additional 60 to 70 percent, it depends a little bit on the stage of mass formation. Uh, it's not really hypnotized or it's not really into the process of mass formation, but it goes along with it just because in one way or another, it never takes the risk of uh, swimming against the tide. And it all, always prefers, most people prefer to always uh, remain silent and uh, to choose the route of the, of the least uh, resistance. And that's what, that's what most people do. And then there is a small group. It's, of course, these figures are very uh, relative. There is a small group who... Uh, uh, tries to, to step up and to speak out. Uh, and this group is somewhere in between 5 or 10% usually. But sometimes it is even smaller. And even then, it can win. That's the most important thing. If you look, for instance, at the huge mass formation in France during the Dreyfus affair, uh, then you could see that there was a minority of the French people, something like maybe 100,000, somewhere 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, some estimate, who spoke out, who who who... Uh, uh, stepped up and who said, like, look, we don't go along with this narrative. We uh, want uh, a, a new trial for, for Dreyfus. And these guys, they refused to shut up. Uh, Emil Sola uh, was one of them, of course, the most famous of them. And they won. <laughs> they won. So a very small group of people, if they continue to speak out, no matter what happens, uh, uh, can have a huge impact and can win. It's even very likely that it will win in this respect that if it continues to speak out, okay, there might be some victims in that group. Nobody can exclude that uh, certain things happen to these people, but if they are not too impressed and if they continue to speak out in the end, they will just prevent the mass formation to go deeper and deeper and deeper and to reach that stage where uh, the people in the masses start to uh, destroy the people who do not go along with them. And in this way, it's very simple. The elementary mechanism is very simple. The masses will exhaust themselves. They will become weaker and weaker and weaker at the psychological level, uh, while the, the small group will become stronger and stronger and stronger at the mental, spiritual, psychological level. And in the end, uh, this group wins. I, I've explained that in some other podcasts, I think. Uh, it's a very specific phenomenon when there is like a huge pressure in society, when, so when there is a, the emergence of a mass formation, uh, um, society always dehumanizes. And when there is, there is very often a small group of people who uh, prefers to go in exactly the opposite direction and to um, stick to the principles of humanity to become more and more humane. And this group, if it persists, uh, will grow stronger and stronger and stronger and in the end, uh, it will deliver new principles for human living together. And that's what we are going through now uh, at the worldwide level, I think. Uh, I, I everywhere see how there are, there, is a, uh, there are groups of people who are very determined uh, not to, to give in and to, to, to continue uh, to refuse to buy into the narrative, to go along with this ideology. Mm. And I hope to continue to speak out because that's the most crucial thing, I believe, both at the, at the mental level as well. If you continue to speak out, no matter where, in your own family, uh, in the shop, on the market, doesn't matter where, you will go through this fast evolution as a human being. You will feel how uh, there is this um, quiet, strong power that becomes stronger and stronger and stronger in yourself. And in the end, um, uh, uh, it's this kind of process uh, that is a true purpose and a true meaning. Uh, uh, of everything, I believe. Uh, that's what uh, makes that uh, this entire process of mass formation and totalitarianism uh, leads to something beautiful and new. Uh, that's what we have to focus on, I think. We have to try to stick to the principles of humanity and then everything will start to have purpose and meaning, no matter how difficult and even dangerous it might become. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, I, I agree. That's very positive. And Ray, Ray, participant called Ray, he messaged saying that BBC, even the BBC, <laughs> said that if you have more than 3.5% 3 of the population on your side, change cannot be stopped. But I, then I just think of China and Hong Kong and things like that. It's, yeah, I mean, I can't stop fighting for the, you know, but... 
yeah, <clears throat> just have to pray. <laughs> yes. We don't have to think too much. Mm. We cannot predict what will happen. And the only thing we can be sure of is that we will stick to the principles that do to, to elementary ethical principles. And we will have to reinvent these principles. We have to re-articulate them because that's what every human being has to do. Every human being has the task to reinvent the ethical principles, to re-articulate them in his or her own way, in such a way that it truly become uh, our own principles. Uh, um, and that is the most important thing we have to do. All the rest uh, is out of our control and uh, all the rest will be done for us, I think. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Diana. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to Sue Parker Hall next for your question. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, and thank you, Matthias. I, th I think you've done, uh, you've worked a miracle really with providing um, a, con a context, a map, um, some making sense and meaning of what for me was really quite confusing phenomena. So I really, really thank you for that. Um, I'm a psychotherapist, so I work with individuals, groups and medium sized groups. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to, to kind of talk to you. You've covered some of what I'm going to say in your previous answer to Diana. Um, but, but you're very clear that um, a mass formation can't be challenged with another mass formation. Um, and that the opposition to it needs to come from sovereign individuals um, who do not all think alike. Um, now, this has made me think of developmental psychology and of Jungian psychology um, and, and the process of individuation. And to my mind, individuated folk are more likely to live by the kind of set of ethical and moral, moral principles that you're describing. Um, that, that actually are quite universal amongst kind of pro-social people. Um, and and I, I, I just wonder, um, and it also means they can more easily bond, bond with people and live, a, live and let live. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you think that supporting people to move out of their original symbiosis to individuate and separate um, is going to be helpful at all in, in this dissolving or breaking up of the mass formation. Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. I think that that exactly is indeed, uh, as, you, as you said, uh, I don't believe you can fight mass formation with mass formation. Mm. Um, in that case, uh, you will be destroyed because you're the smaller group who uh, is organized uh, according to the same uh, destructive principles as the larger group, and then usually the larger group will win. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that the people who do not go along with the mass formation don't have to uh, connect, because that's what exactly what they have to do. They have to form a group without becoming a mass. And the difference between the two definitely is first and for all, first and foremost, that um, a, a, a fruitful group, a truly humanizing group uh, is formed because individuals connect to each other, because there are strong, loving, you could say, bonds yeah. between individuals. In a mass, a mass is formed not because the individuals connect to each other, a mass is formed because each individual separately connects to the collective ideal, to the collective. And the, the bonds between the individuals impoverish more and more the longer the mass formation exists. And in the end, the bonds between the individuals become radically weak. There is no solidarity anymore between the individuals. The only solidarity that does exist is a solidarity between the, between the individual and the collective. And that makes, of course, that people start to snitch and, and report each other to the state uh, or to the collective, no matter uh, when they believe that, every time they believe that, uh, someone is not loyal enough to the collective. So, uh, indeed, we have to form a group, a group built on strong connections between individuals, and the second very important characteristic of this group, and that um, relates to what you, talk, to, to what you just said, 
the most important uh, defining character characteristic, uh, the most important uh, point of group identification should be that everyone in this group is um, is uh, encouraged to speak out in his own way, to have his own opinion, uh, because that exactly is what this group uh, is made for, just to mm. protect people's right uh, to have their own opinion and to articulate to all practice the art of good speech in their own way, as mm. they wish to do so. And that indeed boils down, I think, to a process of individu individuation. Uh, that's exactly mm. what... Uh, the the um, uh, in a mass, all individuation is destroyed. The masses do not permit of any individ individuality deviating from from the group norm. Said Kennedy, uh, and that's like, exactly the problem of mass formation. Mass formation is like a regression to a state of absolute fusion uh, with the other, in which there is no individuality anymore, no uh, yeah. individuation. The, the process of indiv individuation is completely. Um, uh, completely reg regresses, and in a in a in a in a truly um, uh, humanizing group, a humane group, uh, there is like a sound balance between uh, individualism and collectivism, mm. and as it should be, uh, every individual should realize that it has to sacrifice a little bit of its freedom and its own. Uh, enjoyment, for instance, uh, in favor of the group and the group identity. And at the same time, the group should always realize that it only uh, exists uh, for the sake of the individual. So there is, has to be a balance between the two. Uh, no. I really, I really like that. Thank you so much. Is that, that. a an that, answer that, to your question? Or? It's, a, it's a really very good answer. I, I mean, I conceptualize the relationship to the collectivism as a kind of fantasy bond in a way it feels like a kind of fantasy bond and and just you know thinking that individuated individuals can tolerate much greater number of differences and are not not mm -hmm. threatened intimidated diminished but by them so thank you thank you so much you're welcome Sue. thank <laughs> you thank you Sue. i'm going to come to francis next if you could unmute yourself francis i'm on my way to put you on the screen There we go. Hi there. Matthias, thanks very much for your amazing insights. But your percentages, I mean, the question that I wrote is, is how do you work these percentages out? And why, are, why do you have any confidence in them? Because sadly, looking around at my own entourage of friends and family, incredibly few have actually woken up. They haven't changed a great deal. They've gone on believing the narrative. And I, my sort of gut instinct, just from my own experience, is that probably only about 10% have really woken up. And there might be quite a lot more who kind of doubt things, but they don't have the nerve to stand up and be counted. Um, and I don't know where you've come out, because I think you said 30% from the very beginning would not be taken in. But I really, no. but in the UK, I'm just not convinced that anything like 30% was uh, um, against uh... It's not 30%. You know, uh, in the beginning, you know, experiments which merely uh, investigate group pressure usually find on the, the impact of group pressure on, uh, um, on an individual uh, decision-making usually find about 25% of the people that are resistant, that, 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 that are resilient and that refuse to go along with the group thing. But in mass formation, usually in most stages of mass formation, the pressure in naturalistic mass formation is much higher than in experiments on groupthink. And that results in the fact that usually there are less people who uh, prefer to speak out, to resist, uh, to defy the masses. So you're right. Uh, in naturalistic mass formation, there is usually a much smaller percentage of the people who do not go along with the masses. Usually somewhere else. Yeah, it's hard to estimate. It all depends on, on the circumstances and on the nature of the mass formation. But uh, probably somewhere in between five or ten percent, sometimes even smaller. But uh, but the, the 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 most important thing I believe is that this small group is it makes if it makes the right decision has a huge power. It has a huge power. 
it can, as I said uh, in, in, the, in, in my response to the question of Diana, I think, um, um, uh, even a, a very small group of, uh, even a, a, a few hundred thousands of people um, uh, can, can, um, can uh, resist the mass formation and can eventually um, win against the masses, as happened in France during the Dreyfus affair. So uh, we just, um, the most important thing is not with how many we are. The most important thing is that we make the right decision, the right choices, I think. Um, yeah, through the right choices, uh, you're suggesting that we rediscover ethics and we stand fast to our principles and presumably uh, continue to refuse medical coercion and to follow rules. But the trouble is it's becoming so uncomfortable and aggressive. And, and I feel rather like, uh, you know, a Jew in the 1930s in, in Germany. There's this sort of buildup of hatred towards anyone who criticizes the narrative or has alternative views on health, and let alone be resistant or critical of vaccines. And I'm worried, I mean, would you say to us, go on holding your principles and be prepared to put your life down if that's where we end up, like many of the Jews do? You know, I mean, <laughs> where is it leading? You know, in the Second World War, the resistance made a mistake. The resistance chose to uh, shut up. They stopped to speak out in public space around 1935 in, in, uh, in Germany. And in, in Russia, they stopped in 1930 speaking out in public space. And that was... When it went wrong, within a period of six months, uh, the destruction campaign started. So uh, we shouldn't we should prove Hegel uh, that that Hegel was not right when he said history shows us that history history learns us history teaches us that history teaches us nothing. We should learn something from history, and it is that we should continue to speak out in this case, and for for all kinds of reasons, for all kinds of reasons, be it only to prevent us from being destroyed, but only to prevent the masses to, uh, uh, from the, uh, to destroy themselves, because that's what they always do. And maybe first and foremost, just because through speech, we will evolve, we will go to a higher level as a human being, and we will receive the strength uh, that is necessary in the end, and the inspiration, the revelation that is necessary to um, uh, in the end, um, find a new way, a new model uh, for human living together to establish a new kind of society, which is a truly humane society. So I think all this will last as long as it must last. Uh, this is not without purpose. Uh, nature, nothing in nature is without meaning or purpose. This will all lead to something. And the better we understand what happens, the better we will know what we have to do. And I think in the first place, like a phenomenon as mass formation, definitely this uh, historically unprecedented worldwide phenomenon of mass formation, it has exactly this goal uh, to, uh, to, uh, to push a small group of people um, to a next level of functioning as a truly humane being. Uh, so that's what we have to focus on, I think. Uh, and well, we will, yeah, I hope nobody of us has to die. And I hope that we don't have to lose too much. Um, but nobody of us can predict. And the better we understand what happens, the more we know that actually, we have no choice. If we go along, if we go along with the narrative, if we buy into the narrative, if we, if we give in, um, then we will not save either <laughs> that's the point the people who go along are, are destroyed as well so yeah. we have to step up we have to be courageous and we have to do uh, the only thing uh, that gives this life as a human being uh, that makes this life really meaningful as a human being and it is uh, to stay as true as possible to uh, uh, indeed what i usually call the principle of humanity uh, that's my way of of articulating it the ethical principles uh, yeah uh, that's what I think, like, instead of totalitarianism, all believes that one or another rationalist theory should be the basis and the cornerstone 
of society and of human living together, but that's an illusion. The only thing that can be really a fruitful cornerstone and a fruitful basis for human living together is uh, ethical principles. And of course, we shouldn't formulate these ethical principles in a dogmatic way. We should allow everyone to invent these ethical principles and to articulate them in his own way and to choose his own style uh, of sticking to these in sticking to these ethical principles. But I'm sure that only principles, ethical principles, can be a true basis and a fruitful basis for uh, for society. Mm. Well, great work, Matthias. Many thanks and thanks for answering my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Francis. Um, I'm going to come to you now, Ross. Ross Butler, add you to the spotlight. Here we go. Over to you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, nice to see you again. Hello, Professor. Nice to see you again. Hi, Ross. Um, oh, I had a really easy question for you, but this conversation is so interesting. I'll, I'll try to continue it. Um, uh, you, you, you talk about reinventing ethical principles. Um, that, to me, seems like a really hard thing to do. I wonder if I could kind of just simplify it by saying rediscover existing ones or rejuvenate existing ones, because a lot of what you say presupposes quite reasonably um, that it is self-evident that the individual has has worth. Um, but it isn't self-evident. It just seems self-evident because that's been the predominant ethic of the last few centuries in, in the West, at least. But we have to get there through a very, very long, torturous process full of wars and upheaval. Uh, it was basically, I, I view it as a kind of a Protestant biblical ethic that through great bloodshed uh, emerged with the triumph of this concept that every individual has worth and divinity. And to and so that so that was a reinvention of an ethical principle. And it took a long time getting there. And I think that's what made the West great. And to um, maybe it needs different words, but to reinvent that's going to be, I'd say, tough. And, and last time we spoke, you, you did allude to the fact that there is an ethic within mass formation as well. It's like there, you know, there's a kind of morality. It's just not one that any you know decent person would have subscribed to up until COVID. Um, do you get a comment on on my rediscover versus reinvent? formulation yes 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 you know i believe that the ethical principles are eternal principles so in a certain way they are eternal and nobody can reinvent them but at the same time still indeed i agree when you say that we all have to rediscover them in our own way and i'm sure that uh it was um uh right the name escapes me now uh i mentioned him in my book um, Max Jacob, who said, uh, the, truth, uh, uh, the truth is always new. So, like, we should always find, like, the eternal principles are always vibrating of life. They are, they are full of life and freshness. And we should not always articulate them with the same words. We should, we should always, we should come so close to these, to this, to the real of these principles that they always inspire us to articulate them in a new and different way. It's only then I think that they won't become dogmas and prejudices. I think that's necessary. I think that the the, the true is always new. I, I truly believe that it's it's eternal, but at the same time, living. Living. we always we always have to rediscover it because. Otherwise, it, it, it becomes like um, a dead, dogmatic knowledge, which uh, would only lead to new masters and new slaves, I think, um, in which, yeah, I, I think I agree with you. Of course, we cannot reinvent them in this way. They, they are eternal and they are always the same. Uh, um, as long as mankind exists, it has probably be aware of something of these principles. And at certain moments, there were certain people who succeeded in articulating them in a very evocative way. Um, um, uh, but I believe we all have the duty to yeah, rediscover them 
and to 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 articulate them in, in our own singular, unique way, in such a way that these principles, while they are eternal and universal, also become truly our principles. Right. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, okay, Ray and Sasha, I'm going to bring you up together for this one. You've got very similar questions, so we can uh, have a uh, bounce some ideas off your responses. So. Uh, just looking for you now. Uh, we've got a long list of people here. Ray, where are you? Uh, let me see. I need to put my hand up. Or uh, yeah, can you hear me? that'd be helpful. Yeah, Ray, if you put your hand up, then I, you'll come to the top. Do a reaction. Do I need uh, to reaction? I, I got you there. There we go. Got me right. And uh, Sasha as well. Uh, we've got you both on the screen. Hi, Matthias. Hi. Sasha, do, do, do you want to say it? Because I think you're probably you're muted. Or should I just dive in? So I'm going to run out. No. Go on, Sasha. You muted again. Oh, I'll, I'll dive in then. Cause it looks like, um, it, I will. Actually, the first thing, um, Matthias, just a very quick one. You said on a previous call about how the other side, if you like, would destroy themselves. And I think, given what we've seen in the UK with Johnson and Biden and lots of things in the US, you're absolutely right. So I think it's encouraging. Just uh, you're obviously predicting correctly. So. So I think it's uh, that's fantastic. Um, the question I had quickly, and Sasha can add to it if it's different, reading off the screen, was it builds on some other things people have said about we've got you and so many people and groups around the world doing fantastic stuff, and and there are we are building coalitions and networks. But I think and I think it's inevitable we will win. But I think to really accelerate it, we need to be. I feel we need to be better at building these coalitions and networks. Before I ask you to answer that, Sasha, was that was that your point? Was it similar? Um, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Am I? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so what I was thinking was that I think of us types. I'm going to call ourselves that um, as individual thinkers. Um, uh, the question I put there was when you had, say, like the Soviet movement, you had people uniting through a common understanding, such as the workers. Uh, workers' unions, etc., who became a, a force. Um, my concern is that we are individual thinkers and we don't really want to group together because we are individual. Um, and is there any sort of ideas around how that can encourage individual thinkers to work as some sort of collective uh, uh, in order to in, in order to form some sort of unit that retains individualism does that make sense oh yes of course that's that's the challenge that's the challenge we we are facing now um indeed i agree the people who uh, do not fall prey to the mass formation to the first mass formation usually distinguish themselves from 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 the masses because they are more individualist or at least they are more loyal to uh what seems uh, honest and sincere to themselves um and the problem is always that how can you um, unify this group of individualists or at least people who are not inclined to start to think uh, as everyone else thinks? And I, 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 as I said, it's that's the real challenge. And as soon as we succeed in, in, in realizing that uh, to form a group without becoming a mass, uh, it's all over, believe me. At that moment, it will be all over, but it won't be easy. And it's it's clear what the principles of this group must be. This group must, as I said, uh, uh, to to in response to Sue, I think, um, this group must be a group not because it all uh, uh, is loyal to the same collective ideal uh, or to the same leader. Uh, no, this group must form a group. Uh, because it because the individuals connect to other individuals, and in this way, like a strong network of of of, of strong bonds between individuals is established, uh, and also, well, there should be, of course, a certain group identity. I don't believe that there can be a group that is completely without group identity, and I think that it's it is clear what. Uh, this group identity should be based on this group identity should be based on the on the the, 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 the on free speech for instance on the fact that uh, what is most important and most crucial most defining for a human what is the true backbone of a human being uh, is uh, a kind of speech 
that is truly his own speech, a kind of speech from which you say, like, look, when I say this, uh, I give expression, I articulate something that emerges in my own body and that I believe is sincere and honest. Uh, if you succeed in doing so, and that's a true, it's an art, it's an art. It's the art of good speech. Uh, the, uh, we, we, as a group, uh, we should share this one characteristic, I think, that we all respect and that we all appreciate as um, the highest good, uh, the art of good speech, and that we uh, give everyone else the right to speak in his own way, in a way that is truly his own speech. And that's difficult. It's always difficult. I, I think there is no definitive uh, way to um, articulate this, or there is no definitive way uh, to conceive how this group should be uh, should be organized. But I think that that's one major characteristic that it should be based on uh, on, uh, on 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 the art of good speech and on uh, on the the fundamental right, which is, according to me, the really the most fundamental right of a human being, the right to express his own opinion in his own way, to articulate his own opinion in his own way. That, you know, one of my previous books was all about that. We underestimate constantly the importance of speech for the human being. What distinguishes us from animals is speech. It's speech. It's animals use sign systems. These sign systems can be extremely complex, even as complex as human language, but it's different from human language in this respect that a sign system of an animal, that a sign used by an animal always refers in a straightforward way to an object, to something, an external reality. And that's why animals never are really insecure. They are sometimes they doubt a little bit, but uh, when they receive a sign from another animal, they usually will not go, go through a, a phase of, of doubt and, and existential uncertainty. Human beings, uh, uh, on the contrary, constantly are confronted with a lack of knowledge. We always think that human being, beings distinguish themselves from animals because they know more, but that's only of secondary importance. What truly distinguishes a human being from an animal is that a human being is constantly confronted with something it doesn't understand and doesn't know. You will never see a, 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 a human, a, an animal sitting on a bank, uh, pondering over the question what the meaning of its life is, whether the other animals, uh, 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 whether whether it means something to the other animals, whether. Uh, the other animals love it or something, no, whether what, what will happen after death or something, no. Animals are not confronted with this tormenting lack of knowledge the human being is often confronted with. And that all has to do with speech. It's because human language uses a kind of signs that do not refer in a straightforward way to an external reality, but that refer to other signs. Words, in the first place, refer to words and dependent on the context in which they appear, they refer to a different object. And that's why the human being is never sure of what the words of the other mean, or never completely sure. So, and 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 um, uh, there is no definitive answer to what uh, the question, to how the questions of life should be answered. We all have to answer them in our own way. And that's where the art of speech becomes so important. We all have the fundamental right to... Uh, give meaning to our lives in our own way. And we can only do so by speaking out and connecting in a linguistic way to other human beings. Um, thank you. That's great, thank you. To both of you and uh, to, to Matthias, uh, one second. Thank you. Okay, thank you, so we're uh, coming to you now, Peter, for your question. Um, there was a number of people in the chat who wanted to hear the response. So I'm going to bring you up now uh, for your question. Uh, you're currently muted, Peter. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Hi, Matthias. Hi, everyone. Um, absolutely great book. I ordered it as soon as it 
uh, came out beautifully written and argued pulls together so much that I've reflected upon for years so I'm recommending it a lot I think the biggest challenge is that people see this title and they think well it doesn't apply to me that's about Stalinist Russia or Nazi Germany you know not interested but in fact there's so much in it it's so such a rich analysis um, and I love the mechanistic ideology stuff um, I've been working as a business psych for the past 30 years, I also studied anthropology at university um, and we did the witchcraft trials and all that stuff. My question is around how do we help people overcome the cognitive dissonance and guilt? So cognitive dissonance is when people have, you know, are going to resist an idea that will call into question the wisdom of their own past choices because they passionately advocated and defended it. And obviously the pandemic really got people doing that it's very hard to actually acknowledge i might have made a mistake here um, so that's the cognitive dissonance the other one is guilt and i'm not talking about psychopaths who know exactly what they're doing and don't care i think there's probably a lot of well-meaning technocrats and politicians who imposed on people's lives you know coerced them took away their freedoms and it's a horrible thing to wake up and realize that you're good intentions have actually caused untold misery for others. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Yes, of course. Uh, many people will prefer to die rather than to wake up. Definitely. Or kill or kill you. Or kill you. <laughs> trying to wake yep. them up. Yes. But that's where we have to be. That's where we have to start from the right analysis. That's where the, the, uh, our analysis of the situation in particular of the psychology of, the, of, of what happens now, is so important. It's not a deliberate, conscious uh, kind of process that is happening now. It's rather a kind of madness, a kind of madness, at least for almost everyone, for most people, even people like Bill Gates are radically hypnotized, but radically hypnotized. They are convinced that they will save the world. I'm sure of that. They are convinced that it will save the world. I don't think, I, I, I know that it's not popular, popular what I will say, but I don't think that Bill Gates is a psychopath. Bill Gates, Bill Gates is a typical megalomaniac, someone who believes that he will save the world and who doesn't see that if he doesn't watch out, he will destroy the world and he will destroy himself as well. And of course, there is enjoyment in this process because he, of course, sees himself as a godlike figure who will be among the first to, to, uh, to, uh, to receive eternal life from his technocratic ideology. But it uh, doesn't take away that somewhere uh, he doesn't see himself as a devil, but rather as a god. <laughs> and, I think it actually and, um, helps, doesn't it, to, uh, um, to see that to see that with some humor, like almost feel sorry for these poor, misguided people. It yes. makes me slightly less frightening. Do you agree? You, you know, why I, why I think it's so important is because I believe that uh, also someone like Bill Gates uh, will be, his hypnosis will also be disturbed by the, people mm. who, by the people who continue to speak out. And the better you understand that, the more you see how, how important it is to continue to speak out. Because if you think it's a psychopath uh, who is just uh, uh, in, in the, who possesses his full uh, uh, common sense, then you believe that it's better to hide, to hide as deep as possible uh, uh, and then and, and to stop to speak out. And that's the fundamental mistake we shouldn't make. I'm sure people like Bill Gates are so convinced of their ideology that they, are, that they don't care, that they are numerous thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of victims, doesn't matter because they are so convinced that they will create this new technocratic paradise uh, uh, that, that they believe it's justified to make as many victims as they want. That's the typical characteristic of all totalitarianism. But if you mistake it, if you mistake it for a classical dictatorship, and you, if you, if you make the wrong analysis there, uh, uh, it might be fatal. And uh, the better we understand that we are dealing with people who um, uh, are fanatically convinced that their ideology is the only one that can save the climate and the and humanity and so on. Uh, um, the better we know what we have to do. Um, <laughs> that that's that's I, I believe that's the. It's so tempting for us to consider the other someone who um, 
this diabolic and evil, and who knowingly uh, tries to um, do evil, but we, we are dealing with the ultimate evil here. And the ultimate evil always succeeds in convincing the people uh, its instruments, the human its human instruments that they are doing uh, the best thing, <laughs> and and that's that's what they have to realize, and that's exactly why our speech, when it is sincere and honest, will have a huge impact also on these people. They won't wake up, but they they will be they will be inhibited, and and manifesting their full destructive potential. And that's what we need. That's the only thing we need. So my question was around the resistance to waking up. So we might not talk about a Bill Gates, but a friend or family member who's kind of wedded to that ideology at the moment, how do we gently wake them up? Because there's gonna be a natural resistance to it, isn't there? We, we can't, I think, I think we can't, we should watch out. We shouldn't have the ambition, I think, to convince them and to wake them up. But we, we only should have the ambition, I think, to uh, stay true to our own ethical duty of articulating our own opinion. Okay. And, uh, like and, and, and then, then it works best. Then it yeah. works much better than if we try to convince them. And, yeah. you know, the question as to the, the true nature of totalitarian leaders is extremely important. And it's also extremely complex. That was so fascinating when... At the trials of the of the Nazi officers, um, um, the leading Nazi officers, that in a baffling, mind-boggling way, these guys truly believed that they that they did their utmost best for the Jewish people. If you read the letters that Eichmann, for instance, wrote uh, to uh, um, Jewish rabbis, for instance, in, in in European cities, you can't believe what you read. You can't believe what you read. He he said things like. Look, I understand that you are not as enthusiastic as we are about our project. And he was talking about the Holocaust. He was talking about the Holocaust. But I think we, uh, uh, um, uh, but I think it's your duty to help us a little bit. But and 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 Hannah Arendt said, Hannah Arendt said, and the, the strangest thing was not that uh, that Eichmann asked that to to uh, to the Jewish rabbis. But the strangest thing was that a Jewish rabbi, rabbis indeed helped him a little bit. So, so that's the, the mind-boggling, almost incomprehensible process of mass formation, which has such an enormous impact also on the leaders of the masses who commit cruelties and who know that they commit cruelties, but who still believe somewhere that they do everything in order to realize this new paradise uh, that is so tempting for them. And now what we see now is the purest example, is the purest example of people who believe that they have to reshape the entire society, that they have to, have to transform society into this uh, internet of bodies um, uh, in which everyone is, uh, everybody is satisfied with nano chips and other stuff and, and monitored through a powerful internet. They know that numerous people will die and still they believe that they do the good thing. They still, they believe that it is the only way to save the world from the rising sea levels and, uh, and to control the masses and so on. Um, uh, so again, we shouldn't think that we are dealing with classical dictators here. We are not. I don't say that the Nazi officers somewhere were not aware of the cruelties they committed, but they were constantly believing that they would um, uh, rewrite history and that they would establish a new society which was far better than any society, any society that existed before. And now we are dealing with the same people. The ideology changed a little bit, but it's the same madness of people who believe that they have to control each and everyone and that they have to reshape the entire society. Uh, into a society where the individual has no freedom anymore and is passively subjected to the ideology and to the state apparatus, and they believe that they will save the world in this way. That's what I think. That's what I think. Thank, thank you, Peter. Uh, Matthias, I think we're out, out of time. We've gone over our time allocation. We've got quite a few questions left. Do you want to take one more, or do you want to? Are you, are you got a hard stop now? Yes. I can't, I'll take one more. I see a lot of critical remarks here. People who don't believe that uh, that the leaders of the masses 
believe that they do something good. If someone will, wants to ask such a critical question, please ask it, ask it because it's crucial. It's crucial, and that's what we have to talk about because that is crucial. Well, yeah. So, what? What is there a specific comment that you picked up on? Uh, I, 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 I saw a comment. Uh, so, uh, Mengele meant it all well with the Jews, something like that, um, or Mengele. You know the. Yeah. The, yes. I said that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, if someone wants to ask, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll, can I ask Matos the um, this thing about because we, we've seen it on the chat and so many times we say, "Oh, Bill Gates believes this or believes that." How how does any of us know what he believes? He may he may be a saint, um, but I think things like climate change, you know, they they fly to conferences in private jets. Yeah, and you say, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, the COVID thing. You go through that and you think if they if it was about safetyism. They wouldn't have suppressed ivermectin. They let other voices, you know. I mean, how gullible do we have to be? We bring it on ourselves a gullibility. I, I'm thinking. I yeah. never said. I never said that I believe that they truly are saints. <laughs> they right. are. They are instruments of evil. I'm sure of that. But but, but the levels of lies, Matthias, are so incredible to those who actually wake up. But it's hard to believe this is all benign and being done through stupidity. You no, can't no. lie like that and not no. actually have some kind of agenda in mind. It's opinion. not stupidity. It's not stupidity. But I advise everyone to read uh, the works of the of people such as Trotter, Lippmann, uh, uh, Bernays, uh, the, yeah. the founding fathers. I bet Bernays, the, yeah. The, the, the founding fathers of, of modern propaganda. And these guys, these guys truly believed that society, uh, as political leaders, are not really leaders anymore, political leaders... Uh, or just followers because they have to try to gauge what the population wants and then give them what they want or, other, or otherwise they won't be re-elected. So these guys all believe that uh, as political leaders are not true leaders anymore, they needed to establish a huge, to create a huge propaganda machinery to constantly manipulate the, the masses and the population and to prevent them from falling prey to their own irrationality and their own aggressivity. But what they forgot was something that uh, uh, Gustave Le Bon already said in the 19th century, he said, the people who lead the masses very soon are hypnotized by the masses and they become even more irrational and even more destructive and self-destructive than the masses themselves. And that's how the diabolic pact between the masses and their leaders uh, emerges. Just there are masses who want to be misled and manipulated and there are leaders who want to manipulate and mislead the masses. And that's how you end up in this, what Hannah Arendt called this diabolic pact between the leaders, the masses and their leaders, which is the essence of totalitarianism. So these guys know very well that they are lying. They know very well that they are lying about almost everything. But you have to distinguish between ideology and narrative. So the leaders usually fanatically believe in their own ideology. In this case, transhumanism, for instance. They believe that the only way to save the world and the climate will be uh, a transhumanist society. But they know very well that the narratives they use, the climate narrative, the corona narrative, and so on, the narratives they use to convince the population to go along with this transhumanist ideological changes that need to be imposed to society, that these narratives are lies, or at least that they are a kind of propaganda. Um, the, 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 it's much more complex, I think, than just a group of people who are um, who want to control everything and and who 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 only want to be in control. I truly believe that these people really are driven by ideological conviction and fanatic belief in this transhumanist ideology. That's so what you I you are saying then that they are lying in order to deliver a greater good that they passionately believe in. That's what they believe. And they, and they believe that the greatest good for a human being is always to more or less speak in a truthful way. That's what they believe. That's what they forget. And, and, and that's the first way. They, they try to create a society which is a paradise. And it always turns out to be an inferno, a hell, just because they completely miss the point when it is about uh, uh, what is truly uh, valuable for a human being. The first value of a human being is always that its speech uh, is more or less truthful and more or less sincere. 
And with their propaganda, they become 100% liars and cheaters and manipulators. That's the problem. And, and Matthias, from what you said, could it be, again, we can't know exactly what's in their heads, but, but I think it, it could be that this small minority of parasite class, what you want to call them, that they are, they do believe in this transhumanism thing, but it could be that they believe that that vision they've got is not 8 billion people on this earth, it's 100,000 people, which is them and their mates. You see what I mean? We don't know. But it, it, it could be that, couldn't it? It's greater good. Their version of the greater good could be like me and my family. Yeah, yes. Uh, just, 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 I mean, I, I know we get into. You know, it's it's more it's more complex than yeah. I described it now. You you know when you look at the psychology of totalitarian of totalitarianism and 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 totalitarian leaders, you see that the top level of the totalitarian leaders usually uh, is very much can be surprising ideologically driven. They really try to impose a new ideology to society, but the lower levels are often full of. Perverts, sadists, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, psychopaths, and so on. Uh, but the top level usually is very fanatically, ideolog ideologically driven. It mm. wants to die, wants to die for its ideology. So I think, and of course, we cannot be entirely sure that contemporary uh, totalitarian leaders in this way have the same psychological profile as the as the as the totalitarian leaders of the fascist systems and of the communist systems, we cannot be entirely sure of that either. So it can, well, uh, but I, I do believe that the, the totalitarianism, uh, Hannah, that, that was also the conclusion of Hannah Arendt, who writes about this in a very nuanced way, a very interesting way. She said they are not primarily, primarily driven by money nor by power. They are in the first place driven by blind, mad, ideological conviction. And that's, it's, it's not, it's a difficult, it's, it's more, it's easier to look at it in a different way, to believe that they are all psychopaths and so on, because in that way we have an object for our anger, to, to, to direct our anger on. If you look at it in a more nuanced way, well, then it's more difficult. But I think it's necessary if we want to choose the right Oh. And, and I agree, we shouldn't say, oh, they're all evil, but at the same time, we shouldn't say, oh, they all 100% have good intentions. I think it just doesn't make sense. No, 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 no. No. Right. And good intentions, good intentions are not very important to me. I mean, uh, everyone can have good intentions, but uh, uh, to really make the right choices and to follow the right principles, that's uh, 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 what it is all about for a human being, I think. And do you oh, think okay. they are their own intentions or are they, as Penny's asked the question, do they come from above? Are they instructed from above? As, as, does this go higher than than the individual at uh, the, the, those levels? Well, that, it's a good question whether the public leaders or the true leaders. Um, probably not. Probably not. Uh, the true leaders of, of, of this emerging system uh, probably operate uh, somewhere um, from behind uh, the screens, probably. Um, they might have a different different psychological characteristics. Um, it's hard to know. It's hard. These, these guys are hard to know. We don't know exactly what they're, at the psychological level, how they look like. Um, it's easier to know the, psychology, the psychological characteristics of the public leaders of totalitarianism, such as Hitler and Stalin in the first half of the 20th century. These guys were blind, fanatic ideologists, that's for, su that's for sure. Uh, and to what extent they were themselves uh, puppets on the strings of masters? That's a good question. I, 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 I'm inclined to, to, to see everything in a, as a complex dynamical system. Uh, it's it's very it's often very hard to know who the true leaders are, and I truly believe that the point of gravity of a totalitarian system is always situated in the masses who are in the grip of an ideology. I believe that the ultimate enemy is not a human being; it's an ideology. It's a way of thinking. It's a, it's a certain view on man and the world, and that also is is a rather well. It's not very comfortable to think like that because in that way. Um, uh, you have no real human enemy uh, and you cannot 
belief and the illusion, I think, that everything would be solved if we killed a few people. Believe me, it wouldn't be solved. It wouldn't be solved. Surely the propagandists um, in, impose that that ideology on people, you know, do, do they not? They did. They did, yes. Yes, but, but of course there, there have been... There have been so many types of propaganda and there was one type that was successful and it was this type of propaganda which matched uh, the psychological characteristics of the population. That's something that was very well explained by Jacques Ellul in his wonderful book Propaganda. He said there is no propaganda that can be successful if it doesn't appeal to the deepest preferences uh, of, of, of the population. And the, the, that's what that's the weakness of the population. The human being usually will always choose for something that makes his life more easy and more comfortable in the short run, even when that means that in the long run, it will lose uh, the core of its existence as a human being. That's the weakness of the human being. You can always seduce it by something that makes its life more comfortable and more easy in the short run. And that's exactly what this mechanist uh, ideology always does. Mechaniz the mechanization of the world, the industrialization of the world, technology, it always promises us that it will make our lives easier in the short run. And that's why every time we choose for more technology, more mechanization, more industrialization, to be more a slave of machinery and of the elite that possesses the mach machinery. So that's, that's the weakness of the population. The propaganda could never be successful if it didn't appeal to certain weaknesses that are inherent uh, uh, in the human being. And that's what we have to realize. We have to realize that we are part of the problem, that the population is part of the problem. And that the first thing we should try to change is our own um, weakness and our own way in which we are enslaved to the system. And that's, that's, that's yeah. We, it's, I think it's important to criticize Bill Gates and the World Economic Forum, it's important. Let's use 20% of our energy for good fundamental criticism. And let's use the, the, the remaining 80% to change ourselves and to, to see how we ourselves uh, uh, are part of the problem and, and support this ideology even without knowing it. Th thank you all for the di dialogue here. I'm conscious we're over time and we've got quite a few people with their hands raised. Right. Um, uh, just, just a comment on what you've just said. I, I recorded a video on this last week. Actually, it was our highest performing piece of content where actually we, we flipped the mirror and said we've got to get uncomfortable, realize our role in this situation. And it's, it's, it is uncomfortable for people to fit, to recognize that we are part of the mass, regardless of our views. We are, it, it is a transaction. <laughs> and I agree with you on the complexity and the nuance. It's so important to get into that because there are so many uh, tech. Tech innovations, technology is developing, and they're not coming from one single source. You know, it's 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 prolific. There is with digital IDs, it's 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 worth billions already, and it's not it's not it's not a concentrated market. It's a very disparate market, as as are transhumanist technologies. It's a very disparate market. It, it's even though uh, there is concentration of funding, if you actually look into the proliferation of these new technology markets, they're very broad, very di di distributed. You know, it cannot possibly be of a single stringed puppet master. Uh, I'm not saying that there isn't influence from uh, major funders, for instance, and uh, ideological leaders within some of these breaking technologies. But you also have to recognize that the culture itself is driving a lot of this. And to your opening point uh, around our mechanistic worldview, that is cultural, that is societal, that, that affects us all. And it's, it's not until we shift our own worldview and actually recognize that we are individuals within a society. Society is nothing more than a collection of individuals. Then the more of us who can shift our own worldview, the more we actually shift the dominant culture and narrative. And uh, you know, that, that, that requires us to take responsibility and that's uncomfortable. Well, I will have to go guys. And um, uh, it was very pleasant and I, I, very interesting for me as well to talk with you. Um, and maybe we can do it on a second occasion when uh, <laughs> when I have a uh, one hour of time again somewhere. Yes, and I'll, be ha I'll be happy to to to, uh, to converse with you again then. Well, yeah, we've got a long list of questions, so we'll keep hold of those for everyone who submitted their questions and got their hand raised. Apologies if we didn't have the chance to answer your question. I hope you found this session valuable this evening with us. 
Um, there's been some real insights shared from uh, tonight, and thank you for all your participation. And again, apologies to those who didn't get to ask ask their question. Um, I just want to say that if you haven't yet got a copy of uh, Matthias's book, this is uh, and it, it, it is described as an indispensable guide to the times we live in. I encourage you strongly to get a copy of this right now. I was very lucky to get a, a pre-release copy for the podcast. Uh, but please do make sure you grab a copy of the book. And uh, I do hope that we can schedule the next round of questions. It's clearly there's lots there's lots of uh, thoughts that have been provoked from tonight. So please uh, uh, give give uh, Matthias a round of applause for his time in, uh, uh, with us tonight. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so very much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, and good good to see you again. So, um, again, we'll we'll wrap up now. Thank you so much for all of you being here tonight. This has been a fantastic event. Um, we hold these guest events every single month. We'll be we're, we're guided by you. We take your feedback in terms of who you'd most like to see on on these events. So, if you are or if you're part of our supporter circle, you'll automatically get access to this. Some of you joined via Eventbrite tonight. Uh, if you become a member of the Elevate Network and join our supporter circle, you automatically get access to all of our forthcoming events. Our next event is on the uh, it's the 27th of July. Is that right, Felicity? I don't know if Felicity's still here. She had a, uh, another commitment. I'm here. He's still here. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, 20, 27th of July. We've got a th- On the 27th of July, we've got a three-hour session on cryptocurrency and the financial reset. We've booked this session off the back of, I actually attended a physical event with a speaker. He goes by the name of Sam. He lives a truly decentralized life. He doesn't give away his surname. Uh, So we will call him Sam X for the purposes of the Elevate Network. But if you're interested in the concept of the Great Reset and what's happening with the financial reset right now and where crypto, decentralized technology, blockchain, et cetera, fit into this, that's going to be an amazing interactive session. We've allocated three hours for that one, and that's on the 27th. It'll be between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. There will be a break in between. Don't worry. We're not going to have you sat there for three hours straight. Um, but but having attended his talk in person, uh, it's a really powerful talk. So if you remember, you're a part of our supporter circle, you'll automatically get access to that. Um, uh, next week, I think we've got a break, and then we've got a community event the following week after Sam. Uh, so um, in the side of the network, if you keep us in the loop of who you'd like to see next on on the platform, we can, we have access to all of our guests from the podcast, from not only the Elevate podcast, but the pandemic podcast that preceded it. And if there's anyone that we've yet to interview on the podcast or we have yet to bring to the, the network, then uh, please do let us know who you'd like to see, and we'll do our best to get them booked in. We've got Helena Norberg-Hodge on the 10th. Helena Norberg-Hodge is back on the 10th. We supported World World Localization Day. We had a forum with her. Uh, She's coming back on the 10th. Yep, so there'll be opportunities to meet with her. And any other guests you would like to see in the future, just let us know. Um, There's lots happening inside the network uh, at the moment. We're in the process of moving towards our regional groups. Um, there's some, there was some talk in the chat about meeting like-minded people around the country and across the world. Uh, we are going to start uh, with our regional groups over the coming weeks and months. Uh, we're going to also get out, get out into a live tour. We're going to be working in collaboration with another number of other organizations to get out there. Our, our aim is to get out there in tandem with the kind of political hustings over the next two months. We're not running for government, but we're running out there. We're running out there to talk about what we need to do to create change. So look out for that. Um, Ray and um, several others asked about collaboration. We'll be collaborating with a number of organizations for that tour, connecting people across the UK on a number of different pieces uh, in conjunction with the political movements. So so watch out for that. Um, Do you have any connection to the uh, Freedom Alliance, Dan, at all? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Most most of the organisations that have been active within the last two years, we have uh, worked with either overtly or covertly. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Fight Club rules exist sometimes when we're doing collaborations, given the nature of our work. Um, did, you, did you hear what happened to them with their tickets for the 13th of August in Plymouth? I, yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you weren't aware, the World Council for Health, when they held their conference, the Better Way conference in Bath, they had to cancel their, they, they had to change venue at last minute um, for similar reasons. So it's, it's really challenging. It's a really challenging time. Um, but uh, we, we heard some lessons from Mateus tonight, Mateus tonight, that, that can help us understand that speaking the truth is one of our highest powers right now, as is 
uh, becoming the best and fullest version of ourselves. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is why at Elevate, we're trying to combine personal transformation with societal transformation, recognizing that each of us has a role to play. And that's, 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 our, that's our belief here. And we want to provide the tools uh, for change when it comes to that. Uh, we've got so many big plans for Elevate. We're just getting started. We've got a small team. It's been a challenging start to the year. Those that have been on our kind of all hands call will know we've had some financial challenges in terms of getting financially sustainable. That's why we've launched this membership program to help us to become financially sovereign so we can continue to do the work. We've only got a small team at the minute and uh, in order for us to accelerate our work, we need to continue our hiring. Um, but first, we've got to start breaking even on a monthly basis. <laughs> so uh, if you're not yet a member of the um, supporter circle, I do encourage you to come and join us. You'll have access to all the events, but you'll also be helping us uh, to secure our future. Uh, and if you know people, like-minded people who are not yet part of the Elevate Network or our, or our community, then please do share this because uh, I hope you'll agree that these types of conversation events are deeply valuable. Um, the last thing I'll say, beyond these kind of guest events that we have, we are going to start running monthly community events where you'll have the opportunity to engage with each other in broader discussion. That's, again, been a big request. And we've got some amazing people in our network who have got some really powerful um, uh, frameworks for connecting in groups groups like this virtually, because I know it's not the same as being face-to-face -face in an environment, uh, but we've got some tools and techniques that can enable us to have some really powerful convers and meaningful conversations in groups. So uh, watch this space for that as well. Um, I'm going to say good night for now. We've gone over by uh, 25 minutes from our scheduled slot. Those of you who regularly attend will know that that's a, that's a habit. We should just automatically add half an hour. I'm sure most of you already do that, <laughs> given the track record. Um, but we we will uh, we will um, we did have some bonus minutes there with Matthias. He did say he had a hard stop on the hour, so uh, we squeezed a little extra juice. And again, apologies to those of you who didn't have the questions answered. We've got most of your questions. Um, that were typed in the chat, we'll save the chat and extract those and, and take note of those. If you raised your hand and asked a question and didn't have the opportunity to ask the question, uh, either sneak it in the chat before we close the door right now or uh, post it inside the network and we'll collate them. We'll send them over to Matthias and we'll hopefully schedule another session. Uh, if not, we'll hopefully get some written responses from him or we can record. Uh, we'll ask them to record some responses for us because it's important that we get those questions asked. Uh, but thank you once again for being here. Please do spread the word. These conversations are deeply powerful and your participation is incredibly uh, valued. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are in the world. And uh, keep, keep the conversation flowing uh, and do share your ideas in the network. And uh, together we can, uh, we can uh, affect change. I hope you found that conversation as fascinating as I did. Uh, I'm sure you can probably tell that there were many more questions that we could have asked and the conversation could have gone on for hours. Uh, and the good news is that Matthias is potentially coming back to join us for a second session. So if you'd like to take part in our regular guest events, including events like this with Matthias, then please join us in the Elevate Network at weareelevate.org. We have a supporter program, uh, our pay program, uh, which helps us to fund our content and our work to affect change. If you join our supporter program, then you automatically get access to all of our events, including our forthcoming event on the uh, 27th of July, uh, where we're examining the financial reset and what role cryptocurrency and blockchain may have in the future. Is it a positive? Is it a negative? What does it mean for our freedoms? Uh, so do come and join us inside the Elevate Network. We've got a, a fascinating discussion forum and regular events, and we're uh, about to launch a series of regional groups and a regional tour. So it's a fascinating time to join us. Come and see us inside weareelevate.org and join our private social network. It's been great with you here today. Thank you so much for watching. And please do share this conversation so that we can help to reach more people with important conversations like this. Thanks again. My name is Dan Aston Gregory. You've been watching our private Q&A recording from our session with Professor Matthias Desmond. Thank mm -hmm. you.